Hi, everybody, and welcome to the next in our CEO interview series with Hernan Lopez, the co-founder and CEO of Wondery. Hey, Hernan. Hi, Jason. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. Great to have you as well, too. And, and this is a special treat for me because Hernan is one of the CEOs that not only that I have looked up to and learned a lot from, but someone I've gotten to work closely with. So we'll talk about that some more. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. For those of you coming back, so happy to have you here in our ninth uh, interview series here in combination with Entrepreneur Media and Comparably. I'm Jason Azar. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Comparably. And we are an employee review platform that helps companies out with their employer brand, recruitment, marketing, and helps try to just make sure that we're building absolutely tra transparent and fair workplaces to make it understandable what it's like to work at great companies like Wondery. Uh, we're both based here in Southern California. I'm a serial entrepreneur, so I've started and sold some companies in the venture back space before this and have the privilege of being a, an investor and, and a board member in a number of companies, including Wondery, which I've been so honored to be part of that journey. And, and this series is really one where we get to have really thoughtful and vulnerable conversations with incredible leaders like Hernan. And so, you know, I think Hernan that um, it is absolutely incredible what you've been able to do with your team here in the podcasting space. I know so many folks know already know about Wondery and your amazing lineup of shows, but maybe just in your own words to start, you know, describe what Wondery is to everyone out there. Uh, thank you, Jason. So Wondery is uh, the largest independent podcast publisher in the U.S. We're known for those very emotionally immersive storytelling shows like Dr. Death and Business Wars and Over My Dead Body and Boonga Boonga shows that want to make you, the listener, feel that you're in the middle of the story. Whatever is the subject of the story we're telling about, what we're telling, uh, we want to move listeners. We want to get listeners excited and uh, feeling empathy for the characters and sometimes um, thrilled and sometimes a little bit nervous, whatever it is that we're talking about. And we've um, based here in Southern California, we have 68 employees, most, most of us here in LA, some in New York, uh, some in Portland, San Francisco, London, and we've had, I think we're known for having the most number one shows of any publisher. We've done 28 shows of ours have hit number one on Apple Podcasts in just under five years. That's absolutely incredible. Can you, I know a lot of the shows are household names for folks and are becoming TV shows and movies. Can you go over a couple of the main shows that people may know these days? That's uh, actually, I even forgot about talking about the television business, and but we can uh, speak to it uh, later. In addition to all the ones I just mentioned, they're all being adapted to television. The Shrink Next Door is another one that we did uh, last year about a psychotherapist who manipulated his patient. And that's going into production next month with Will Ferrell and Paul Rad at Apple TV. Um, we are um, known for history shows, American history tellers and American scandals. So some of those shows have long running seasons that have been around for a couple of years. And every month we have a new season, a new um, cover, a, a, a new story that we cover. Uh, one of the most fun uh, new shows that we have launched this year is called Even the Rich with uh, Brooke Sifrin and Arisha Skidmore-Williams, where the two of them go through uh, families like the Kennedys and the, the royal family and the Jay-Z and Beyonce and the Gettys and the Murdochs. And every month uh, they have a new story where we get to empathize again with people who we realize are different from us, but they have so much in common with us. Yeah, you know, I am a avid listener for anyone out there who may not have already listened to programs like Dirty John and Dr. Death. They're some of the most riveting content you'll ever listen to. My favorite show these days is the new one, Bunga Bunga, which is the story of the Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi. So uh, it's an incredible lineup of content. Uh, what I'd love to do is just walk folks through a bit of your timeline because your career journey was so accomplished before you became an entrepreneur. And to me, I think one of the things that stands out is there are a lot of folks, Fernand, that have had a lot of professional success in corporate roles, but very few of those folks either have the guts to take the leap to be an entrepreneur or when they do are able to do it with any measure of success that you had. So we'll get to that part in a bit, but I'd love to just walk everyone through, you know, your journey and how you got to where you're at today. You know, where did you start in your career and what were the steps that you took? 
to the CEO spot and founder spot of Wondery? Uh, thank you. So uh, I grew up in Argentina. My very first job was as a copywriter for a radio and cable television company. And uh, that from the get go really mark uh, uh, something that I will try to replicate on every single job, which is have a foot on the creative side and another one on the business side. And uh, I think uh, in media, any person that can pivot and navigate both worlds is going to have more success than if you're only focused on creative or only focused on business, but it's hard to do and because the, the two very different parts of the brain. The other thing that really helped me was that I decided for a number of reasons to go to school at night and work during the day. So I started my professional career at 19 and uh, I was you know, starting an advertising degree while working this job at, at this company, which then led me to another similar company that was radio and broadcast. And at um, 26, I uh, went to work for the local um, Argentinian ad sales representative of Fox, Latin American channels, which at the time was you know, the beginning of really long expansion in international cable television where people are broadcast to cable. And um, a few months later, they invited me to um, move to the US, to Miami more specifically, because they had an opening order. And at 27, speaking very little English, uh, or actually I spoke English, but it was broken. It wasn't just great. And they, they said, doesn't matter. You live in Miami, so you're only going to be speaking English for about a third of the time. Uh, I decided to take a chance and, and, and move to the US. And, uh, and that, that really was one of the big first risks that I took in my career that would uh, pay off over time. Wow. And, yeah, and then you had a, this incredibly stellar career, you know, in the corporate world of Fox. Can you, can you talk about, you know, your progression there and, and some of the things that you felt that you did differently than your peers to have so much success and, and, and climb that corporate ladder? Uh, I, so I spent 18 uh, years at Fox. So it was a long, long, long time. And again, from my late 20s all the way to my mid 40s. And uh, the business that I went to oversee, uh, Fox Latin American channels, well, obviously one of my heart was just um, in, in ad sales and then eventually became the GM and then promoted multiple times. We went from $35 million in revenue to $3 billion in revenue by the time I left. And 150 people to 4,000 people. And obviously, over all that period of time, there was a lot of um, expansion happening in the industry. So we, I, I was fortunate to be there at the time that cable television was taking share from broadcast uh, television pretty much around the world at different spaces, different, at different speeds. Um, but I, you know, the, the industry, uh, what's happening, in, in your industry, what happens in, in your business is only one part of um, career trajectory. Uh, the other part is what do you do, how you conduct yourself, uh, who you surround yourself with, and what decisions uh, you take along the way. So I think one of the probably the one of the first uh, decisions that I I, I really um, I'm thankful that I took was in 1999. I had been in sales in Miami for then two years, and I like Miami, but I knew that if I wanted to really take off uh, at Fox or anywhere else in media, I would have to move to either New York or LA, uh, places that had you know, very strong um, talent networks and where both, you know, most media companies were uh, based. But I also knew that if you're in sales, it's hard to be perceived by your bosses as anything other than a great salesperson who has the potential to one day be the head of sales or run the overall revenue organization. Uh, not impossible, but it's hard. Uh, unless you do something that makes people put in a different box. So I decided to go back to business school. So, and I took an executive MBA at the University of Miami. I knew that at the time, my, the, the then general manager was an MBA herself and uh, that simple change really made everybody in headquarters at LA realize that I really had ambition and I wasn't, I was going to just put the work of working during the week and then doing business school on weekends uh, on my own dime as it happens uh, to, 
to, to, to really learn what, what it took and, and also to get a US education because my degree was from Argentina. And it worked. About um, uh, eight months in, uh, there was an opening for uh, a PL job here in Los Angeles, which was my first one. And I still kept traveling back and forth every weekend to Miami to finish the MBA because I wanted to make sure nobody that, that I completed the education. I'm thankful that, that I did. And, um, and that really started the beginning of my, my growth at Fox, right? So that was about three, uh, three years into my career. Yeah. I, I often talk about this idea that anyone that wants to achieve something big in their career has to have a big burning why. And as long as you have a big why, you always figure out the what and the how. And if people don't have a big why, they use the what and the how as an excuse for not doing that thing they said they were going to do. You know, early on, you know, maybe when you were a teenager or very early in a career, what was your why? What was that thing that was pushing you to try to have a bigger professional life than maybe a lot of the people you grew up with? It's interesting. I, I think it was this drive, this desire to be independent uh, and the fact that when I was in high school, I was the editor of the school newspaper. And I think I told this story once, I was kicked out of school because because of one uh, cartoon that I drew that, or a series of cartoons that, that really made fun of the professors in a way that they didn't uh, like. And, and they didn't kick me out precisely for that, but they found something else that I did that they found disrespectful that was an excuse for them to um, kick me out or ask me to, to, to essentially to leave the school. So I had to finish my education in another school. And, and that, that, that was tough at 17. Also, um, was um, realizing that I was gay, but I hadn't told anybody. So I had this dual insecurity of, I just got kicked out from my tribe. And also I happened to be gay. And this is 20 plus, almost 30 years ago, I'm sorry, uh, 30 plus years ago in Argentina, not the same as what it is in the US. So I think a lot of my drive to be independent and to be self-sufficient came from that moment, that, that foundation saying, you know what? I, don't think, I wanna put myself in a situation where I won't have to depend on whether, um, you know, uh, or not on whether somebody needs to uh, give me a job or approve of me. And I am, again, they, the, the, and probably that had a little bit to do with my desire to move to the US because when I was at, you know, at, in Argentina in my mid twenties, I had risen to professionally to a level where I could feel there would be a ceiling and, and also being gay meant that there was just this not being not one of them um, uh, feeling that that would make it very difficult for me to get promoted. And then I moved to, I mean, I started to talk to people who worked in the U.S. and they said, no, none of that happens here. Little did I know. But, but definitely it was a much more open and 100% a more merit-based society and still is today than almost anywhere else in the world. And, uh, and I like that here in the US, people got ahead by what they did and, what, um, and, and the results that they brought. And they said they did what they were, um, they said what they did and they did what they said. And that was something I, I just found very, uh, just, just, just attractive and was a big reason why I moved here. Yeah. I mean, you've been an incredible leader. You have both building a diverse company and focusing on underrepresented folks. I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit. To me, one of the things that's so unique, and I've told a lot of people uh, about this about you, is that you know I've met a lot of folks that are incredible corporate executives. And I've met a lot of absolutely amazing entrepreneurs. It's very, very rare that I've met someone that's done both of those successfully. And I'm not sure I could have had the kind of success that you did in a corporate role. You know, obviously we're going to talk a lot about your entrepreneurial journey, but I'd love to just pick your brain. You know, what would you say are the two or three most important things that if someone says, you know what, I'm not going to be an entrepreneur. I want to get to be a senior vice president. I want to get to be a C-level exec at a large corporation. What are the two or three things that distinguish the folks that have that kind of success from other people that maybe try to go that route but aren't able to achieve it? Um, that, that's, that's a very good question. And let me, let me try to parse it out. I think the, the, number, one, um, the number one skill set that you need to have is to be a good judge of people 
and surround yourself with people that give you operating leverage, right? People that, because you're going to realize that um, the day only has 24 hours and you only have two hands. So at some point you're going to run out of time and hours and your ability to continue to do more will depend on people that you're surrounded with. And so if you're surrounded with, you know, with me, with yes men, you're going to get uh, not great results. If you're surrounded with uh, brilliant jerks, you're going to get temporarily great results. And then at some point, you're going to spend a lot of time fighting. So finding, just being a good judge of people is an, absolutely a, a skill that, that, that you need. The second one, um, and, and you know what? One, one thing that I learned probably later than I would have thought, but, but, uh, but it, it's definitely something that anybody in their 20s needs to learn is how to interview your boss. Because everybody goes to a job interview so excited about, am I gonna get to the job and you know, what if this? But you waste so much energy um, by reporting to a toxic boss or a boss that doesn't have anything to give to you that you can, and it's gonna take a while to figure out once you accept that job and then you realize, oh, my boss is not that great. It's gonna take a while to get out of it. You don't wanna switch jobs uh, you know, quickly. Uh, so reporting to a good boss is one of the best, one, one of the best possible uses of your time. I always tend to think about you know, leverage. Well, what are the decisions that you make that maybe you invest a little bit and have a huge impact? Um, the business school wasn't a small investment, uh, but it had a huge impact. Mm-hmm. But there are other small smaller decisions that, uh, that I made because I was given this advice and had an em- enormous impact. And one example that I, I'm thinking of always is uh, when I was in my 30s, I had moved already to Los Angeles from Miami. So I'm not already, I mean, I'm no longer in Miami. So therefore my English needs to get, get better. And because I learned uh, English life, I had a stronger accent than I have uh, today even. And um, my, my, after my second, third promotion, this very senior executive at Fox, uh, who reported to Ruben Murdoch, um, gave me this incredible piece of advice that I don't think anybody would dare to give to us on employee today. Uh, she took me, uh, she, she said I should go to accent reduction classes. And think about it, I mean, I'm in my early thirties, and this like, British woman who had everything to lose by giving me that kind of advice, right? If you, today, a lot of people say that's insensitive or that's um, discriminatory. And I saw it as a gift. Uh, it took me, I yeah, probably went for six sessions over a month and a half, my career took off. And it wasn't the only thing that I did, but it, as far as ROI, probably one of the best investments that I ever made. So, you know, at some point here, and, and I want to go into the motivating factors, but you make a leap from, you know, having this massive P&L and being this incredibly successful global executive in an industry that so many people are trying to get into, obviously media. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what was it like, what was the hardest part of the transition to being an entrepreneur and going from running a, a massive organization to a small company? Like, what did you feel like you were least prepared for in the day-to-day operations of a startup? I think um, it was the, just the number of times that I got told no over the first year. It was quite taxing. And, and it, it, but it, it's one of the tests of whether you have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. How do you take your no's? How do you take rejection? How do you, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's something that you, you need to be very comfortable with and you need to be comfortable with uh, learning how to separate the fair no's or the no's from which you learn from the unfair no's, which you're going to get no matter what, but you can't let those get to you. Um, that, that, that's what I would say. Yeah, I think one of the things that, you know, people see when they see a company as successful as Wondery is they just assume it was a rocket ship you know, from day one and everything was perfect, you know, that first year or two, 
you know, you really hit the pavement and did so much fundraising and you were self-financing the company. You know, I think there were a lot of investors that were just skeptical of audio and podcasting as a category and wondered how big a business can this be and never imagined, you know, that someone could come in and build, you know, one of the largest media companies reaching, you know, tens of millions of global people, you know, what was it like for you to just have to stay the course through that first year or two when you were trying to fundraise for Wondery? And, and what do you feel like in hindsight now, mm -hmm. you know about that fundraising process that you wish you knew at that, that time? Um, I, I, I can't you know, emphasize how hard it was because on top of trying, you know, one thing that we should say, the podcast industry was tiny at the time. So a lot of these VCs were very justified in telling me that your market is not big enough. Why um, should why should we even bother? So I'm, I'm thankful that they even took the means. So they took the means because um, I came connected. I had a lot of friends who, who just got me in the right uh, place. And, and to make things even worse, at the time that I was starting the company, uh, my ex spouse at the time got into a really bad uh, accident that left him in a wheelchair for six months and unable to work for nine months so here i am with a startup all the people telling me no two kids who were you know at the time uh four and five and my my, my spouse in a wheelchair and, and it, it was just like a, a, a just a tough 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 year in many respects and um the if there's anything uh the, there's a great book by the way that i've recommended to every person that i know that starts a business called get backed um, about how to fundraise. I wish I could meet the guys who did it because I, I'm always mindful. I'm always so thankful to people who have gone through something tough and they share what they um, because it has every detail from how to um, prepare a deck to what kinds of things you pay or what kind of questions you're going to be asked in uh, a meeting. And th those questions are code for what? Jason, you are one of them, right? You, you told me you've done it before. You told me when a VC is asking this question, what they really have in the back of their mind is that question. And you need to say this. Um, it's, you know, raising money is obviously part of the, um, part, part of the, the, um, uh, the journey that every entrepreneur needs to take, but, but it's needed because it helps you be more disciplined with your, allocation of resources and your time and it makes you it helps you hone in your story and um so again i'm thankful for all those no's most of them anyway <laughs> the ones who were not particularly nice i'm not thankful for but you know what just yeah they, they missed out and same question and and i i know i got to pull this out of me because you're one of the most humble leaders i've ever met so i i really got to ask you to to be able to self you know, not even promote, just self-identify your strengths mm -hmm. in the same vein of talking about what you did in the corporate world that was really successful. Mm -hmm. You've obviously built this incredible media brand so incredibly quickly. It's a testament to the entire team, to the content, but what would you say are the couple things that you do as an entrepreneur and a CEO that you feel like has helped lead to the most success at Wondery? What are those two or three superpowers that you have that you feel like if other people employ skill sets like this, it will help them be, be as successful as possible. So I think, um, and this is related to the question of why you should, whether you should be an entrepreneur in the first place, or not, whether you should pursue this idea or not. One, one of the best pieces of advice I got is that your idea needs to be something that you're so passionate about that you will do it for free. So mm. if you ask if, Nobody paid me to do X. Would I do the X for free? And that was 100% true of Wondery because I was becoming uh, a power podcast listener and yet I could not find podcasts like the ones I liked. So I, I came to the uh, industry after I, about a year later um, listening to uh, Serial and Startup. And then went out and I, my mind was blown as a listener, especially more for startup because it was very bad. It was about a company, a podcast company like Wondery, but a year earlier. And 
I want to look for other shows and I tried to decide what I tried to find other shows like those and could not find anything. And then went into this exploration as to why is it, what, what could it be that there weren't any, any shows like that. And um, without boring everybody, I, I, I made, I found an analogy between the television industry and the audio industry, how television really changed after the year 2001 when on-demand television through TiVo was possible. And then the shows that followed were all serialized and character-driven, uh, like The Sopranos and uh, Breaking Bad and Mad Men, Game of Thrones. Whereas in podcasts, uh, the priestess of two podcasts was talk radio, and talk radio is not meant to be listened serialized. So if you were, uh, if you look at the stats for any um, audio listening, uh, you'll find that for the longest time, music accounted for 80% of our time spent with audio, and then uh, spoken word audio accounted for 20%. That those shares didn't change much, but the spoken word audio was essentially talk radio. Um, sports news, you know, opinion, and uh, audiobooks, and some public radio. And that's it. Podcasts were not in the factory. So I started to question, is this a demand problem or is this a supply problem, right? Is it that there are no more shows like Serial and Startup because there isn't demand for them or because nobody has figured out uh, how to get people to, to, to like them? And it just dawned on me that television had gone through the exact same um, you know, change to about 15 years before. So the same change was going to happen to audio. Uh, and, and, and again, I, I think uh, the, you know, the, the um, advice that I'll give to any one entrepreneur is that you have to be fanatical about the product that you're making. You have to, ideally, you have to be a consumer of the product that you're making. I, I, I find it very difficult to believe that somebody can start a company in a product that they are not a passionate consumer of. And, uh, and you need to find your reason to be. You need to find what is it that your uh, product is going to be that is not served by um, other companies in the space. And that's usually the hardest part. Um, and, and, and of course, you realize that you don't immediately go from uh, point A to point from no business to having something that nobody uh, sees, but you just got to be disciplined about making sure that you don't make moves that deviate you from that trajectory. If you want it, so for, for us, what we wanted to be is we wanted to be the home for more emotionally immersive storytelling shows, mm -hmm. right? So if you listen to any wondery show, um, the, the, you know, that sound design that, the way we score, the way we select hosts, the way we script is very um, unique to us. Uh, we compare internally to the Pixar or Marvel playbook. So if you watch a movie from Pixar, you can immediately tell that it's from Pixar. Same with Marvel. But now, can you tell that a movie is from any one of the other studios? Not necessarily. Uh, and that's what we want to see with the Wondery shows. You go into the world and you immediately can tell that it's a Wondery show. Uh, so, again, I think uh, that's essentially what I would advise every entrepreneur to, to do, to find an idea that they're really passionate about and be disciplined about how to get to execute on that one idea. Yeah, I mean, obviously, in, in tech companies, you talk, there's this concept of product market fit, you know, and I, I think what you were the content, it just, it was something you hadn't heard before. I mean, early on when people were listening to, you know, Dirty John, like the quality of the storytelling, the interviews, the way it's all put together. And then what you realize is, you know, to me, I think what was so special about Wondery is it, it actually helped create more demand for podcasts. Because when you realize that there's this kind of quality content you can listen to, you find other parts in your day to want to listen to it. And, and you build your day around, hey, when can you listen to this serial podcast that you're just dying to know what happens with the rest of it you know how much do you feel like you had to hold that that standard up for everybody say hey we're going to do something really special and unique here because i think you hit on something that's so key of like you have to be obsessive about your product you know like talk to about, about that early on we um yes i think the um the, the early 
And, and as you say, the first year we tried a lot of stuff and didn't work. It was really in our second year that we found our, um, our, our sound, our style, and, and, our, and, and, and how we could scale the, um, the, the, the model so that we could be in front of listeners more, more and more often. But the, um, what, what I would say was one of the aha moments was when I realized that up until the moment that uh, Wondery started, all the narrative podcasts of quality have come from public radio or people who used to work for public radio. And I love them, but they sounded very similar and they didn't sound the way that a television, a Hollywood television movie or television show um, sounds. They, they, if you, you know, there was this great article um, about how sometimes they stutter intentionally because they feel that that's the way normal people talk. So they leave stuttering in the um, script and they use um, very unique scoring with oboes and jazz tones and things that are very sophisticated, but they're not popular necessarily. And we, again, we live here in Los Angeles. I come from the television world. My, Head of content comes from film. So we know what Hollywood sounds like, and that's the sound that most Americans are used to hearing. So we figure that if we could apply that sound to podcasts, we have a niche that nobody else had. And that niche will become eventually not a niche, but it will become the um, prevailing uh, sound podcast. Amazing. All right. So we're, we're going to spend some more time talking about Wondery. I do want to take the time machine exercise. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, you could get in the time machine, and you could go back into your 20s. Right. You could give Hernan at that, that point of your career any personal or professional advice. You know, what advice are you giving yourself and why? Um, I think, you know, what, what I'm um, talking about it briefly before is how to interview your bosses to weed out toxic people, to, to weed out toxic bosses, because you don't realize sometimes when um, you're in one of those relationships where your boss is not great, uh, just how much time you waste in staying in a relationship. And what does someone do if they find themselves? I mean, it's, it's not as if someone can just change their manager. If, if you identify that you have a, a bad or a toxic boss, what should out. somebody do? Get out, get out, get out, get out. You should, but get out with a new job, right? Don't quit without a job because that doesn't look great on your resume, find another job and be careful when you're interviewing with the other job not to badmouth your current boss because that's never a good look, but get out what you can because some people think that they can change their bosses. No, they can't. No, yeah. bad, bad boss cannot be changed. And, and what would you say are the most important signs of a bad boss? Because some things it may be style, maybe of a boss that's demanding, you know, to you, what are the two or three things you see in a manager that when you, when you recognize that now, you could tell somebody that's not going to be? Yeah. Yeah. So, so typically it's deflecting blame all the time, never taking responsibility and blaming other people, including you, for problems that are really uh, his or hers. Um, not showing personal interest in you um, is another red flag. I know that you know, some uh, people are more just naturally inclined to say, hey, how are you doing? So for example, when, you know, over the summer, I spoke, uh, I took time to uh, spend half an hour with every single employee at Wonder because I felt that it was something that um, I just wanted to do. I know that not everybody has time to do that, but everybody has time to ask you how you're doing before you start a conversation about uh, business. And, and sometimes I call like little hints that, just like I get a good vibe with a person that cares about me and cares about my future, in addition to making their numbers. Um, I, you know, the particular toxic boss that I had it was used just, not just making me work long hours on the weekends, but uh, you know, mixing his personal life with work in a way that just made me realize I was a pawn. And then I spent, four years on this guy because I really admire him in a number of ways. And, and then I realized that uh, it was just a toxic relationship and I, 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 I gained so much from exiting that. And I think a lot of people do that. The, um, the other thing that people 
in their 20s uh, should always do is create, uh, just focus, you know, take, um, realize that just doing your job is not enough. Um, because a lot of talented and hardworking people uh, believe in the fallacy that if I just do my job, everything else would take care of itself. And no, it doesn't. You need to actively tell your boss what your goals are. You need to have goals. You need to um, you know, be, um, be a little self-promoting. And obviously, if you're too much of a self-promoter, that's a turnoff to everybody and people see through it. But you can't expect that just other people will notice that you're doing good work and automatically get promoted, and you'll get mm. um, you 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 you'll, you'll, you'll keep um, you uh, doing better in compensation and every other way. But by the way, that doesn't mean that everybody wants or should be a manager. Um, but if you want uh, ultimately to be a manager, and be careful and think about whether you really want to be a manager. But if you want, you, you should make that known. And you should show in every possible way why is it that you have the skills to just manage a group of people. Yeah, I have this 10% rule for folks early on in their career, which is my 10% rule to success, which is first, as you said, make sure you're in a good environment where people will appreciate you and recognize you. But if you just put in 10% more effort and focus on the people around you, you can get a hundred percent more results. Yeah. And so make sure that that 10% is on really important things for the business. But if everyone else is working a 45 hour week, you work a 50 hour week, you'd be the first one in the last to leave. And in that extra time, don't just do tasks, make sure you're working on the most important outcomes that you can possibly influence for the business. And if you do that consistently, that 10% investment is going to lead to a hundred percent more career growth. Yeah, the the other one is read a lot. I, I read a lot articles, books. Um, I was uh, an, an avid reader at the time in the twenties of um, the um, Harvard Business Review, The Economist, and every business book you can think about. And it's difficult to uh, read business books. A lot of them are, as Scott Galloway says, uh, yoga bubble. So just to find the ones you need to ask a couple of people or at least read a number of reviews. Good to Great was a book that really changed my trajectory uh, from Jim Collins. I read other books from him. It, it, it really changed the way I, I think about business. And, and it just makes you, um, whenever you're having a conversation with a boss or your boss's boss, because remember sometimes the decision to promote you won't be your bosses, but your boss's bosses. So both need to be connected. In fact, when I was moved to LA, he was my boss's boss who made that decision of taking me there and, and promoting me. And, uh, and you just need to be prepared. You need to be preparing to be engaging and, and, and show that you actually are intellectually curious and, and, uh, and you, you have disciplined thought. Same thing, time machine question into your 30s. So you you can go back and give Hernan in his thirties, any piece of personal professional advice. What advice do you give and why? Um, I think in my thirties, um, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, the thirties were a great time for me because that's, you know, coincided with, um, the trajectory when, when I went from, um, head of the Latin American division to COO of the overall division. I found that I was always comparing myself to others and that made me unhappy. Mm. And it's, it's tough with somebody who's competitive. A lot of people are, you know, who are successful are competitive. Uh, that, that constantly measuring yourself or your own happiness against the grass on the other side is bound to make you unhappy. And uh, nobody wants to be around unhappy people, however much you can hide it. Um, there's just a number of things I learned then later in life, how to meditate. We'll, I know we'll talk about life hacks mm -hmm. later that uh, I wish I had learned um, earlier in life. Yeah. To me, I think one of the things I try to take a Buddhist philosophy because mm -hmm. I, I think you have to be competitive and I think you have to want to win but I also think you have to be able to compartmentalize it where when you're in your work zone, 
you know, there should be that drive to always want to be the top, the best, build the best company, have the largest market share, do the most for your employees and your customers and your stakeholders and investors. But then, you know, when you go into family life, personal life, social life, community life, I think there needs to be a switch to turn that off. Or as you said, I felt the same way that when I'm often most unhappy is when I'm comparing myself to situations I haven't yet achieved and I'm thinking, well, why am I not there? Right. Instead of just appreciating the things that, you know, I have and my family have that so many people don't have the good fortune to have as well. The, the, the other, look, I mean, the interesting thing is I had two roles during my forties. I was the head of the Latin American and UK uh, divisions of Fox International Channels. And I was also the COO. Um, so we well, have effectively the number, but that makes you a CEO in waiting. And that, that situation can be deeply frustrating because you always, in your mind, always like when, 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 right? And uh, that, that's just not um, something that, that, that is healthy. Uh, eventually my boss himself got promoted and I got promoted to his job around the same time that I had my first child. And so that was all when I hit 40. And, and so I think the forties were a, a completely different stage in my career. So let's, let's dive into some of those life hacks. I, I'm always so fascinated, you know, what are the things that people do to find some extra productivity? What are the ways in which you feel like you are mentally able to stay at the top of your game? You know, what do you do today that makes you as productive and successful as possible? The um, a number of, again, books that I read over the years uh, really had an effect. And then doing therapy, as every Argentinian kid will do, had an effect as well. Um, I, I'm thinking particularly about uh, the, the books by Dan Ariely or Charles Dohig about habit and, and, and behavior and, and a great book that my boss David Hasselman gave me called An Intelligent Life uh, by, a, by a great Australian psychologist called Julian Short. Um, the, and that, that, that book really was uh, extremely, extremely uh, influential in, in my life. He gave it to me when I was in my 30s. Um, I meditate, uh, but that's something I only learned to the last five years, and I do it through um, an app. In, in fact, it's the One Plus app. So I use the One Plus meditation before I use other apps, and I found that what we do is, is as good as, if not better than what the other apps do. I've been exercising um, consistently for the last, I wanna say probably 20 years. And, and I, I, I try to do it five times a week and I always feel better after I do it in the morning um, because I also believe that in the more anything that, that's automatic, you should do in the morning uh, and everything that's automatic, you should do with, with, you know, without thinking. So the less decisions that you, your brain has so much time to, or to energy to make decisions in a given day. So you shouldn't decide whether to brush your teeth or not. It's sort of automatic, right? So the more the decisions you can put in that automatic side, the better. Um, and uh, sleep is so important and so underrated by people. I consistently been going to bed at uh, 9.30 for good 15 plus years. Uh, and I wake up at you know, 5.30s, which means I'm getting that those rare, incredibly, obviously it, exceptions were where the kids were born. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm sleeping eight hours a night. And that, that really, whenever I don't, it, I, I can see the effect. Yeah. What do you do to find productivity in the work life? I mean, I think one of the things that I've always been really impressed is like how tight of a meeting you run. You know, you're, you're a really incredible um, recruiter, you brought an amazing, diverse talent into Wondery, you know, across all different backgrounds. What are the things you feel like you've picked up along the way about how to run meetings well, or how to hire top talent, or how to structure not yeah. only your workday, but your team's workday to get as much productivity as possible? Um, so I'm a huge believer in starting meetings on time. So I show up, it's very, very rare that I don't show up exactly at time or a minute earlier. And when you send a message, that travels through the organization. So if you go and ask almost anybody else I wonder, they're gonna tell you the meetings start on time. It's hugely disrespectful when people, you know, just stroll in, uh, especially when they're, they're required. And you, ideally you need to have, if not an agenda, 
you need to have an idea of what you want to get out of the meeting and be able to steer the conversation back to the subject of the meeting when it veers away, which sometimes it will. The, um, so that, that, that's for productivity. I'll, I'm also a big believer in not overscheduling um, your day. If you look at my agenda, you rarely find a day of back-to-back -back meetings because I, I, you just need to have your, your gaps. And uh, I know some people go as far as Jen, my CEO, she goes as far as booking <laughs> times in her, her calendar to make sure that nobody else books her. Uh, and uh, and then, but but I I, I don't I, but I believe in just balancing meeting time and non non meeting time. Um, interviewing and recruiting is the most important thing a CEO can do, uh, or, or almost any executive, because of what I said before that the the, the law of the two hands and twenty four hours, mm -hmm. and any time that you take um, interviewing. Um, and vetting, think of it as an investment because the amount of time that companies take getting rid of bad hires, uh, which usually include the time that they know they have a bad hire, but they feel bad, uh, so they don't know anything about it. The amount of time that they spend compared to the amount of time that they could save if they just took an extra month at the front end is staggering. The, um, the, 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 I've been listening to uh, No Rules Rules by Reed Hastings, uh, which I highly recommend. It's a great book. And obviously people know about the Netflix uh, style and how much time they put in hiring and making sure that they always have the, the best talent and, and the tests that they have, the so-called keeper test. I don't know if you heard about it. Um, the keeper test is if you... Um, if somebody who comes, who uh, works for you, told you that they've been recruited by a creditor, this is the key, um, would you fight to keep them? Yeah. If the answer is no, you should probably fire them. Mm -hmm. But it, it was actually, I was relieved to say, because I am not, oftentimes I have really great people who work for me and they come to me and they say, I have this great opportunity to start my own business. And you can't tell them, no, you should stay with me, right? If somebody has that fire in their belly that they want to be an entrepreneur, why, like, who am I to tell them, no, you should not do that um, because I want you to be here. Uh, equally, when I was at my last job, um, there was this unspoken rule that before uh, hiring somebody internally, you need to get permission from the head of the division. And I did it. Uh, because it was expected of him, but I, I think that's just so unfair to the person who's, um, you know, be, who could be hired. Because I, I do realize that managers feel protective of their people and they feel that they are, uh, they invested, quote unquote, uh, time in training their best people and they, they, they shouldn't be internal poaching. But I, I, I believe that just if there's an opportunity for somebody in the organization, um, to be promoted to another role in another division, it would be patently unfair to stand in the way for any reason other than that person is not the best at that job. Yeah. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was don't ever let any great team member you absolutely want to keep mm -hmm. get to a point where they need to ask for a raise, meaning you yeah. should always be as their manager or as the leader of the company ahead of them talking yeah. about, hey, we want to increase your comp. We want to get you more equity. And, and just make it so that no one even ever has to have the question in their mind, you know, am I getting paid enough for my contribution? Yeah. Um, I've also really evolved my thinking over the years on the teammates. And I have different conversations with folks. I think when I was younger, you know, I took a much more uh, unthoughtful point of view of, well, maybe just someone's not doing the job well enough. And so they shouldn't be on our team. I've really come to think about it differently over the years where I'm like, everyone can and will do well in the right environment. Mm -hmm. We just may not be the right in my environment for them. That's right. And so we're going to be super transparent and clear about who we are as an organization, what we stand for, what we do well and what we don't do well and the challenges we have. And let's just make sure that that lines up with somebody else's, you know, skill set and desires. And if it doesn't, you know, that parting of ways doesn't need to be this 
awkward, bad thing in somebody's professional career. It can actually be a, a positive transition to a better environment that's going to help them be more successful. Uh, and I, I think it's added a lot more fluidity in our process of how we both bring people onto companies I run, but also, you know, have them transition to their next role. Um, again, I think you've done an incredible job of hiring team. What are the things that you do today in the interview process that you may not have known to do 10 or 20 years ago that, that helps you identify when there really is somebody special and unique for your company? So we, um, I, I do a lot of culture vetting, which I didn't do at the time that I was at Fox, not, not as much. And, and by culture, um, obviously your culture is going to be created by example and also by the people that you bring into the organization. And we have uh, six very clear values of wonder, character, care, care, diversity, drive, and fun. And everybody who comes to Wondery needs to be a person who shares one of those values because they can't be taught. You either have character or you don't. Mm -hmm. You either have wonder, wonder's code for curiosity, or you don't. You either are driven or you, you don't. Uh, then separately from that, we have something called the behaviors and skills like radical candor. That's something you can learn. Uh, and that's something that we practice uh, here at Wondery. And um, I, Believe in uh, you know interviews by multiple people, not a lot of people, but it's very often that you'll get five people to interview here at Wondery, and we compare notes after the fact and before. And then I believe a lot in reference checking. A lot of people just um, you know take that uh, you know skip that step, and and they sometimes end up paying for it. Yeah. I, I think that's an amazing playbook for hiring. So, you, you know, you brought up culture. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've been pretty open about this. I, I do not think in my 20s and early 30s, I was a good culture leader. In fact, I thought, you know, hey, we're running a startup. This is all just about putting our heads down, you know, growing the business, working hard. And I, I couldn't have been more wrong. And a big reason why I started with Comparably is I really came to believe that culture was one of the absolute most critical components that any organization could have to be successful as a business, wow. right? Ariana Huffington has this great quote that I love that culture is the immune system for an organization, mm -hmm. right? So when anything else is going wrong, you're not hitting your numbers, oh, people are leaving, that's what's gonna hold it together. You know, you've got this, again, incredibly diverse team I think you've got amazing scores again on comparably for how you are in the businesses as a culture leader. What are the things that you do today to try to foster that culture? And, and what are the things that you still want to get even better at as a leader in a company? The, it starts with leading by example, it's essentially leading by the values that you um, espouse and, that, and, and, and by codifying them, by actually writing them and having people talk about them. Every uh, employee that joins Wondery gets a podcast episode called Inside Wondery that talks about the, the history of Wondery and the history of the values and how they came to be and what they mean. Uh, and, and being at the same time very um, disciplined at stopping bad behavior when you see it. And obviously in private, the um, one learn one more lesson that everybody should follow is praising public, criticizing private. Mm -hmm. um, but but also don't just don't let things slide um, because um, sometimes people don't realize what they're doing. Always as good as intentions. That's another great thing I learned from an intelligent life. Um, but stop things that you don't uh, care for when you see them happen, and the close as possible, as close as possible to when you see them uh, happening. And yeah, culture will. Uh, be self-reinforcing once you have other people live by your values and do the same thing you are doing. Again, uh, just um, you know, both hiring people uh, that live by those values and then making sure that people who inadvertently um, slip through the system are uh, pushed out uh, because again, it all depends. If it's uh, something that can be taught like how to um, run a PNL or how to build a brand, that's one thing. But if it's something you can't teach, like be a personal character, then that's something that you need to address as quickly as you can. 
How do you feel like one of your team members would describe your culture? If I was having, you know, lunch with anyone at, at Wondery telling me what the culture is like there, you know, how is she going to describe it? Well, I would hope that they speak about the same things uh, um, that we openly use, the, the words that we use to describe the company, right? But uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody will talk about a collegial place uh, that's very collaborative, that is uh, very creative and, and you know, su surrounded by people who are very intentional uh, and they, uh, they work hard and they uh, feel that what they do is rewarding because what they're doing is they're just bringing the best out of each other in the service of our listeners who are our ultimate clients. Yeah. I know one of the things that you focused a lot on, obviously, rightfully so and, and overdue, right? There's a much needed focus on bringing more numbers of diversity, women, people of color, folks yeah. of all different backgrounds like yourself into companies. I think one of the areas that you've been trying to lead as well, too, is how do you, you we, in addition to making sure that numerically we have more diverse companies, the folks that are in companies that are underrepresented have as much opportunity for, for career advancement. How, how have you thought about prioritizing that and, and why is that so important for you? Uh, it is important because it is necessary and it's, uh, it's going to uh, create a better work environment and one where my goal is for people who are looking at the company from the outside in, look at what, the way we do things here at Wonder and say, this is a place where I want to be part of. One stat we're really proud of is 43% of our employees are people of color. And in fact, we didn't know this until not that long ago because we went by the EOC survey that everybody's motivated or, or asked to uh, fill. And we found that almost a third of people just did not share their identity. So here I am looking at somebody and visually thinking, all right, uh, she's a white woman. And then she tells me, you know, actually I'm half Cuban. And I never would have thought that she was effectively Latina. Um, and, but the second thing that I'm really proud of is the fact that among our managers and above, 41% of them are people of color. That's a stat that I haven't seen in other companies in the media space. And that speaks to the fact that, you know, people here just get promoted and hired because of what they do and, and because of, what they bring to the table and we're really colorblind because that, that's the way it should be. I mean, the, the makeup of the organization and each group should roughly resemble the makeup of the workplace um, marketplace where we're in, which is primarily Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, now, more can be done. Yes, for sure, more can be done. And, um, and it's, it's one of the conversations that, that we're having every week. Yeah. You know, I think that you know, objectively, a lot of people can make the case that Wondery is the most successful new media company over the last couple of years, right? As far as share of audience, brand, net for, uh, you know, if someone else wanted to get into the space of starting a media company, you know, what would you say are the keys for success? What are the things that you did and, you know, are still learning that someone else could take to, to start a, a great media business today? Um, I actually, I need to give credit to Jessica Lessing, the founder of The Information, because this weekend she wrote a great, um, short, but really uh, smart article about the trap that a lot of media new media companies go into, mentioning in particular um, the uh, Weeby as a case study and, uh, into what went wrong. And, and so essentially the, the summary is you you should start small. You should start in a niche that you can win because if you feel that you're going to start a new business and at the get-go, you want to compete with Disney or with NBC or with the New York Times, that's not going to happen. So what area, what underserved area can you find among audience or content that it's truly understand where you can really excel and make a difference the way that the information did with that particular their subscription only service or the way that the athletic did with uh news uh, sports news uh, with an emphasis in local market and did the athletic launch a national business no they went city by city and once they had 
a key number of subscribers in, in one city, they went to the next and then to the next, and then they become one of the most successful new media brands. Um, and of course, we're, we have a partnership with, with uh, the Athletic on, on a daily podcast. So that, that's what I would say. Yeah. And, and what are you most excited about for Wondery when you, you know, when you think of all the amazing things that are still yet to achieve, like what, what, what gets you most excited and gets you most out of bed today? Um, I think the fact that for all of what we've done, we're still in the early innings of the podcast um, industry. Um, only about 37% of Americans listen to podcasts every month, only one quarter listen every week. So there's still so much more opportunity and uh, we're going to, uh, and this is just in the US, if you look at other languages, it's even a small percentage. So I am excited about how we take this brand, which right now is the largest independent podcast publisher and we make it the largest publisher in an environment with podcasts are part of the everyday conversation. Yeah. Well, you know, Hernan, I, I, it's interesting for all the conversations and I still feel like I learned so much about you today. The, the one thing I, I always kind of, there's two ways I always thought about you. One is like, you're someone that's always just beat the odds. And I didn't know some of your early story, right. And I didn't know about you getting kicked out of school and, and how you use that as a defining moment. But I often point to you of someone that just persevered in the company founding process and fundraising process and has now built a company that we all wish that we could be part of or start. The other thing to me that's always stood out, and I don't know if I ever shared this story with you, is just in every case I've ever seen you have an opportunity, you've always asked, you know, acted with the highest morals and integrity. You know, we met because we got introduced five or six years ago to have me help out with one of your shows. Mm-hmm. I came in to record it and I sucked. I wasn't good at all. You, you very gently, you know, let me down and, and I, I was not the right fit for that in any way. And I remember um, you paid me this like way too generous when I didn't even do a good job and I didn't add any value. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this is just so rare for how somebody acts with ethics and integrity and does business. And even when they meet somebody they didn't do a good job at anything. They're still trying to go out of their way to pay them for their time. And, you know, that was my first impression of you six years ago. And it's just been reinforced in every interaction we've had, you know, since then. And um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to have this front row street into Wondery. And, you know, thank you for your time today and sharing, you know, your journey with so many people out there. I think a lot of folks are going to learn so much from your story. And listen, for anyone out there that has not, you know, sometimes there's a show or a program that you love so much that someone hasn't gotten to listen to that you feel jealous that they get to listen to it for the first time. Like I rem- I know how I feel when I recommend The Sopranos to somebody and they haven't seen it. I'm jealous of that feeling that you're going to get to experience it for the first time, you know, because I wish I got that. That's the way I feel about Wondery Podcast. So if you haven't listened to programs like, you know, Even the Rich and Boonga Boonga and Business Wars and Dr. Death and Dirty John, do yourself a favor, go download them today because I'm telling you, it's going to be some of the most captivating content that you'll listen to anywhere. Um, And thank you for all you and your team are doing, Hernan, to keep putting out such great entertainment, especially in times like this where so many of us are just stuck at home. You know, it's nice to have an incredible outlet for content that, you know, is just, you know, really amazing quality. Well, thank you so much. This was great. It was a lot of fun and thank you for everything that you've done as an advisor and a friend and, 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 and being on the board of Wondery. And, uh, and, I, really, and I really had fun. And I hope that uh, your uh, listeners and readers and viewers learn something and they reach out if they have any questions. Because uh, as they can tell, I'm, I, I'm, I, I believe in just helping people achieve the best outcome for themselves. Yeah. Well, I think that comes clear. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today in our uh, ninth uh, CEO interview series here. We look forward to having you join us for future episodes. Obviously, stay safe, stay sane, and wishing everybody the best coming up in this holiday and election season. So take care, and we'll see you for the next episode. And thank you again to Hernan. Thank you. Bye, folks.